Welcome back to Jersey Matters. I'm Larry Menti. There are warning signs that we are headed into another COVID winter, which means things are going to get even worse just in time for the holidays. Here is Dr. Stephanie Silvera, epidemiologist and professor at Montclair State University. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this today. Uh, I was fascinated by the article that you were quoted in about an expected COVID winter. Uh, what do we expect coming up in the winter season from COVID-19? So I think we can expect a certain increase in the number of cases, um, simply because that's what we would typically see for any respiratory disease during what is typically in the past been called cold and flu season, which will probably now be cold flu and COVID season. Um, as we move indoors, um, we're going to be coming into more contact with people in spaces with um, less than ideal ventilation. So, you know, it's New Jersey. Nobody wants to keep their winters op uh, the windows open in New Jersey. And so we are at greater risk of just coming in contact with people who may be sick. There are ways to reduce that risk, right? We know some things that we can do, limiting our social circle a little bit, getting vaccinated, wearing a mask, but we're going to have a mix. And I think that by community by community, we're going to see different rates across New Jersey. Are we concerned at this point the, of, of further mutation and a possible mutation that will be vaccine resistant? Viruses mutate. Um, this virus has been mutating on average um, at least one mutation every two weeks. That's not unexpected. Some of them, most of them, thankfully, um, don't change how the virus behaves. Every now and then we've had one like Delta that changes the transmissibility and seems to be um, creating more severe illness, particularly um, amongst people who are unvaccinated. So as long as the virus is spreading, there is that p potential to have a vaccine resistant um, mutation arise. That said, if we can keep our rates low in general and reduce transmission, that's what keeps those variants from occurring. Well, the number one way of keeping the, the rate low and, and, uh, and stifling transmission would be for people to get vaccinated, but it doesn't seem like that's going to budge. As long as that continues, that we only have a vaccination rate of 60%, 70%, uh, are the vaccinated at risk at all? So people who are vaccinated right now seem to be having a, a fair amount of protection against severe illness. So there have been those breakthrough cases, but people who are vaccinated are more likely to have mild or asymptomatic illness and feel fine in a few days. Um, people who are unvaccinated at this point are the ones who are really um, ending up hospitalized and are driving the mortality rates, unfortunately. So right now, the best thing you can do to protect yourself from this variant or any other variant is to get vaccinated. And then in the meantime, if you're around people who aren't vaccinated, continue to wear a mask. You probably deal with this all the time. Give, give your best pitch to the unvaccinated because th this vaccination hesitancy is, um, is stubborn. And, and I don't think that there's people that know exactly how to talk to friends and family who don't want to get the vaccine. Have you been able to figure that out? So, you know, what's interesting is I think that we tend to lump people who are vaccine hesitant and anti-vaccine all in one group. And there's a lot of reasons why some people are hesitant to get the vaccine, but are willing to have that conversation. And then there are some people who simply do not believe in vaccinations across the board. And so I think we need to make sure that we tailor our messaging to those groups. There are also populations in New Jersey and across the country who still are you know, low information. They're not necessarily watching the news as much as some of us might do. And they still are not sure how to get the vaccine or think that they might have to pay for it. And so I think we need to make sure that we continue to get out the message that this is free and safe and now readily available. So there's no reason not to get it from that perspective. And then for people who are hesitant, really try to understand where is that hesitancy coming from? For some people, they're concerned about their reproductive health because there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation in that area. For other people, they're concerned and there's a lack of trust both in government and in pharmaceuticals. And I think some of that is justified. And, you know, we've just gone through the opioid epidemic. So 
that does not help our pharmaceutical companies in terms of their credibility. But what we need to understand is there's a difference between the scientists doing the work who are really doing this because they are trying to protect lives and then the bottom line econ economy or economics of the pharmaceutical companies. Public health professionals like myself believe in the vaccine. We believe in the people who are doing the work. And right now, if you get are vaccinated, your risk of being hospitalized is much, much, much lower. And your risk of transmitting the virus to somebody who is at high risk also decreases. And so this isn't just about protecting your own health, but it's about protecting the health of your family and your broader community. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you say you put it that way because uh, those who do not want to get vaccinated, it seems as if their argument becomes weaker and weaker the more people that do get vaccinated. So we're, we've gone, the science has gone well beyond the trials. The science now is hundreds of millions of people who have been vaccinated around the world. What are the statistics from that? How many people are, are having side effects? How many people are getting sick uh, that, have had the, that have had the vaccination around the world? So looking at the actual um, getting sick from the vaccine, again, those rates when you look at the denominator, which is um, millions of people now, hundreds of millions of people globally who have been vaccinated are still very, very low. Those outcomes are incredibly rare. The most common thing that people can expect when they're vaccinated is to have symptoms of an immune response. And I think we need to make sure that people recognize that having a mild fever, having a headache and body aches the day after your vaccine is perfectly normal. That's your body mounting an immune response. They think your body thinks that you're, you have COVID and is fighting off what it thinks it has so that the next time your body comes in contact with that virus, it automatically knows what to do and it can spring into action much quicker. So I think a lot of people mistake when somebody complains, oh, I felt terrible the day after with that's going to somehow be dangerous. We did see some really adverse outcomes um, in very specific groups following the J&J &J vaccine. However, that was addressed very quickly and we know how to treat that now. And so those risks have gone down as well. And as you said, there are hundreds of millions of people across the globe who've now been vaccinated, not just with Pfizer and Moderna, but with several other vaccines. And they, the overwhelming evidence is that they are all safe and effective. We were told all the time that it was 95, 96% effective. Is that, was, is that the science right now? There's about four or 5% are getting it? So, yeah, so right now that is still holding up. It, it, it obviously it depends a little bit on which vaccine we're talking about. So Pfizer and Moderna seem to be holding up at about 90% plus. J&J um, &J is a little bit lower. Um, and that is pretty durable. The conversation I know now has shifted about these booster vaccines and whether or not we need them. Um, what we're seeing, and I think the CDC did a good job of prevent, presenting the guidance on this, is that the people who are at risk of having those more severe breakthrough cases were people who were 65 and older, who had an underlying health condition, or for some of our occupations where they are just exposed to higher doses of the virus through their occupation. So healthcare workers, our first responders, teachers in some cases. I know we've strayed from the COVID winter, but I, I actually think this is all related, so that's okay. But I want to come back for just one minute and make it the final question. And that is, uh, we're going to get a lot of people coming back from college, from coming back from schools, visiting this time of year as the holidays are coming around. And as you pointed out, they're all going to be doing in, that inside. And every time we seem to have a holiday, a couple of weeks later, there is a spike in cases, and, and that's to be expected. Is there any way to beat that? Is there any way to, to at least diminish the chance you're going to get uh, COVID? Right. So as, if we're talking about college students coming home for holidays, I think one of the best things that they can do is test before they go home and then isolate as much as possible after that test. Remember, um, if you're negative on the day of the test, you can still catch it the next day. And so really being mindful of our behaviors leading up to those events, if we're going to have family gatherings, um, I would feel personally most comfortable gathering with other individuals who are fully vaccinated um, and doing testing and, and really thinking about who's going to be at the table. Um, you know, if you're going to have unvaccinated family members around an older individual who may have some pre-existing health conditions, you're putting them at greater risk. And so, you know, we might need to either find ways creatively to keep the windows open to eat outdoors. I know a lot of people invested in those outdoor heaters last year um, and try to 
really create environments that lower that risk of transmission. Um, but we have seen from oh, over the past year, you have a holiday and two weeks later, there's a spike. And about four weeks later, there's an increase in deaths and hospitalizations. And that's what we want to avoid. We, we know better now, so we should do better. A vaccine uh, mandate and a mask mandate for the holiday dinner table, that's an interesting concept. That, I, I don't know if it's enforceable, but it's an interesting concept. Well, I think that's happening now is there's, I think the, the challenge that families are finding is that vaccinated, families that are vaccinated are trying to figure out how to navigate and negotiate that with family members that are used to celebrating holidays with, but who are either vaccine hesitant or unwilling to get the vaccine um, altogether. And I think that's going to create some interesting family conversations. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. You're a wealth of information. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Dr. Stephanie Silvera, epidemiologist and professor at Montclair State University. Still to come on Jersey Matters, another concern about the holidays, not enough workers. We'll talk about it next.